Business.com podcast with Tony Rourke and Kevin O'Flaherty. Shoot making you money. Share it on Facebook, share it on LinkedIn, Twitter, our blog, YouTube videos, to you our podcast. It's so hot that it's burning up the stereo. Welcome to the SeizeYourBusiness.com podcast. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty from O'Flaherty Law. I'm joined today by my co-host, E.J. Johnson from Ileana Properties. And our guest today is Tony Langford from Polaris CPAs. We'll be discussing IRS representation. So thanks for thanks for being here with us today. Good to be here, Kevin. I appreciate you having me. So tell me about what you do and a little bit about your background. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm a CPA by trade. Um, so I've got a traditional CPA practice. We focus on uh, primarily small business, but we also work with individuals uh, with tax prep and tax planning. Uh, on the small business side, we'll do everything from outsourced bookkeeping uh, with Internet technologies in the cloud, uh, technologies that are available today that really facilitates being able to do that and uh, take that back office uh, function off the business owner's plate. Uh, mm-hmm. We primarily focus, uh, focus on the, uh, the small business owners, so uh, you know from startup up to 10 million in revenue, okay. uh, and we can get in and help them with all their accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, uh, all their tax needs from preparation and planning, uh, as well as helping them with various aspects of their business from a consulting standpoint. Uh, I've got a, uh, uh, we were talking a, a few minutes ago earlier, very, uh, very, very background uh, yes. over my uh, many, many years uh, of uh, <laughs> business experience. Uh, so we can bring that value to the small business owner. So it's not just a numbers and a debits and credit thing, uh, but really helping that business owner hone in on uh, their business and their operation and understand the story behind the numbers because your numbers will tell you a story uh, that you can and should be using to uh, you know, guide and direct your business and make decisions. Okay. Well, t- tell us a little bit more about your, you know, you got a big background. Tell us about that background. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, where do we start? Uh, I came out of, uh, of college. I went to DePaul University in Chicago, uh, passed a CPA exam, did a few years in public accounting, um, and then uh, switched over to industry. And I made my way around the, the Hoffman Estates area uh, <laughs> with the uh, few Fortune 500 companies that were uh, located over there. And then I got bit by the tech bug. Uh, oh, yeah. When I was uh, with ADP uh, on the dealer services division side, which is our automotive and truck business, I uh, started doing things with uh, PC technology and local area networks and enjoyed that, that computer side of it <laughs> uh, and actually left there, went to a small consulting firm. We were implementing accounting systems, uh, surprise, surprise, <laughs> uh, but also doing the tech stuff, putting in local area networks and setting up computer networks and databases and things like that. So spent about 14 years doing that. Uh, wound up getting back into the accounting side uh, full time heavily about nine years ago. Okay. Uh, started my own practice, and here we are. Oh wow! So what are, what have been some of the differences when you first started to right now, like where you're at right now, as far as the IRS and 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 just dealing with taxes in general? The the IRS, uh, especially as of late, everybody knows the condition of the, the country as far as debts and, def- <laughs> oh, and deficits, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and the IRS is very, very stretched resource-wise, mm-hmm. uh, but that hasn't stopped them from getting more aggressive and doing more work uh, in terms of trying to collect tax revenue. Okay. Uh, you know, So they've really stepped up the enforcement action uh, to try and get outstanding dollars that are owed to them and <laughs> really going after taxpayers that uh, uh, you know have outstanding debt and <laughs> doing things to collect that. Okay. And they, they have a very long memory. They, they move slow at times, but they don't go away. <laughs> you know, I, I equate it to you, you got the horror movie mm-hmm. where you've got the, the person that's running and the zombies chasing them, dragging the leg, and you're looking at it going, anybody could outrun the zombie, but the zombie <laughs> always seems to catch up to them. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the IRS is like that. They just keep coming and coming and coming until your matter gets resolved. Uh, and you can make that permanently go away. It's like one of those Jason movies. That's what it yeah. sounds like, where you just kind of fall and start crawling for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> so you you help people out who have zombies chasing them. You know, and the, that's where we're talking about the IRS representation. Yeah, here. primarily. Uh, that's one of the areas I've, I've recently started focusing on. Um, and one of the, the drivers for that is just the number of people that are currently in the IRS collections division. Um, at the end of 2013, with the IRS stats, they had uh, 12.6 million taxpayers, and that would be individuals and wow. businesses in the collections division. At the end of 2014, there was another 800,000, so it was oh, up to wow. 
my suspicion is once they run the numbers again at the end of this year, it will be uh, higher than it was at the end of 2014. Wow. Economic conditions driving a lot yes. of that with the uh, tough economy that we've had over a number of years uh, definitely feeds into that. Uh, but again, they're stepping up enforcement, so they're being more aggressive in, okay. in terms of going after people and trying to get monies that are owed. So how do you help people who are uh, who are getting those letters from the IRS and they feel like their life is crumbling around them and there's you know there's no out you know is that when they should call you? Yeah, well, and you described that that very well. Um, typically, the way the IRS contacts people is by paper. If you're getting the phone calls <laughs> and it sounds like it's coming from somewhere offshore, uh, and you've never had any dealings with the IRS, it's a fraud call. Don't okay. deal with it. Um, the IRS. You know, at some point we'll contact you by phone, but by then you've got a pile of paper in front of you uh, <laughs> letting you know that they've been trying to reach you and resolve some matter. Um, and that's typically what happens. People start getting a letter, um, and unfortunately, in a lot of cases, uh, they will ignore them uh, for whatever reason. They're, they're afraid of it. Uh, you know, a lot of times people, whether they go to file their return or, uh, you know, they have the return prepared and they see this number, you know, I got to write a check for six, eight, ten, fifteen thousand dollars and I don't have the money to write the check. What they do is nothing. They don't file a return. Oh. They don't contact anybody. And the IRS really looks at those two things, the filing of the return and the payment of the tax as two discrete actions. Mm -hmm. So even if you can't pay the tax, file the return, get the return on file as being submitted and then deal with the money piece later. Um, typically, when I get a client that's coming in that's got uh, you know outstanding IRS debt or some IRS issue, on average they'll have three to five years of unfiled returns. Oh wow! And before anything can be done as far as resolving those matters, what the IRS expects is you get compliance. So you've got to catch up on getting all those returns filed uh, before you can work toward resolving the outstanding matter. Three to five, that's the typical? That That's on average. Wow. Uh, the most I've had so far is uh, 10 years of corporate returns uh, and six years of personal returns. You know, and people, they, they have that same reaction yeah, kind to of that. Pull back like, How do people not file their returns? Yeah. Um, and and more more importantly, why? You know, that they're wondering, why are people not doing this and, and uh, you know, taking care of what they have to take care of? Um and I talked about the, the average client uh, having you know three to five years of unfiled returns. You know some of the other characteristics or you know traits that you see in a typical client. Uh, you know they're in their you know 40 to 60 years old. Typically they've got a few okay. kids. They usually run into some life event. Life has come along oh, and run them over. Uh, divorce, business failure, uh, major health issue or major health crisis. So they've had some things that have been feeding into this, and then you get the the tax issue and the tax return stuff that just piles on top of that, and they're just shell shocked by a lot of things. So you know they withdraw. Um, you know one of the other things that you'll see other people is they're procrastinator. You get the people that just you know yeah I'll get <laughs> I'll to it I'll get do to it, it tomorrow and then yeah to, and tomorrow never gets here and you know a year two years down the road they're they're getting the letters and yeah I should deal with this at some point. And that's the other thing. They, they get in this situation, and then they're going, how do I get out? And they don't know what to do. Um, you know, and that's where we come in. The One of the odd things about this type of work is locally, there's not many practitioners that focus or make this a main, uh, main aspect of their business. Uh, I'm sure if you guys work with an accountant, um, you know, and you get a letter because you're already a client, they'll help you deal with that kind of stuff because you're already engaged with them. But a lot of practitioners aren't uh, actively seeking and looking for this work uh, and just looking at the numbers of taxpayers that are out there. Okay. There, there's a lot of work out there to be had. Uh, you know, so it's uh, been a, a pretty active uh, part of my practice uh, over the past year that I've been really focusing on. It's like I said, with clients in the past, I've you know, helped them out with these types of issues, but really focusing on marketing and going after uh, new clients. I was telling you guys earlier, uh, just in the last week, uh, it's been absolutely crazy. I've, I've been uh, just, <laughs> you know, hours and hours and hours, new opportunities and referrals and, and leads that are coming in, mostly in this area of my practice. Oh, wow. Okay, so you, when you started your, your practice, was it like a leap of faith or did you go in 
knowing that this was what you what you was going to do? Was it one of those things? <laughs> no, actually, it wasn't like that. You know, I've talked to a lot of people, and again, with the economy the way it's been, uh, I really would characterize myself as falling into that uh, category of the reluctant entrepreneur. You know, I, I, didn't I didn't wake up at eight years old and, you know, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and, and go out and start businesses and things like that. Um, you know, circumstances wound up when I came out of, uh, I was talking about my tech background earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working for a uh, Fortune 100 multinational firm uh, in their IT department. And over a, a period of uh, time, wound up working my way out of a job through corporate restructurings and things oh, like that. Yeah. Didn't want to do a relocation. Uh, so I found myself uh, out in the job market. Again. Um, you know, wound up on a contract, and this is where the gig economy started coming into mm -hmm. uh, to play. I wound up on a contract with a uh, financial institution uh, for about 18 months, and contract ended. Okay, now what? And that's where I had the opportunity to make the turn back into the uh, the, the accounting and the finance side okay. uh, with a uh, small startup company. Oh wow. So you've kind of given us your profile of what your typical client looks like in this IRS resolution yeah. niche of your practice. Um, what options do those people typically have? You know, if I've got a looming IRS debt that they've been trying to collect from me, what, uh, you know, other than just paying up today. That's, that's one option. What, what, are, what are the other options? <laughs> that would be more than happy to take a check. What, what are the things that you can help them do to, uh, to resolve that? Well, one of the, it's funny. The IRS has a sense of humor about these things. For you know, the people that haven't filed, uh, the IRS has what's called an SFR. It's a substitute for return. And basically what that is is the IRS files your return for you. Um, and they don't do it in a way that's advantageous for you. They do it in a very straightforward, simple way. So, uh, you know, standard deduction, if you're married, uh, you know, they'll file you as single. So there's a higher tax rate there. Uh, so basically it's an ugly preparation of your return to come up with a tax liability number. Uh, and a lot of cases, what happens when we go in and deal with a compliance issue and get the tax returns filed, we will file an actual real return, which because of its nature and the way the IRS did it will result in a lower tax liability just by preparing the return the right way because we're taking all the deductions we're making sure the income's classified the right way. Uh, so that's step number one. Um, you know, so once we get them in compliance and we find out what the actual dollar amount that's owed is, the question is, what do you do next? Uh, and the IRS looks at a, uh, a tax debtor, uh, and like any other debtor would, if someone owes you money and they have the ability to pay, well, we're going to go after them for what we can, uh, what we can get. Uh, and with the late night TV ads and advertising, you know, the offer and compromise deals and the pennies on the dollar, everybody wants that deal. You know, they see the commercials late at night, you know, I can settle my tax debt for five cents or 10 cents on the dollar. Um, <laughs> those deals do happen. Um, but, you know, you hear the guys on TV, it kind of gives the impression that, you know, we'll get you that deal regardless. Uh, that's a pretty narrow box that you have to fit in in order to qualify for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done. And if we look at the numbers from last year, I think there were 68,000 offers, uh, offers in compromise proposed by taxpayers to the IRS. They only accepted 27,000 of those roughly, so about 40%. So six in 10 chance you're not going to get one of those deals, <laughs> even though you can. Um, I met with a gentleman this morning. Uh, you know, we were talking about his situation and his case. Um, he appears like he would be a, a pretty good candidate for that. Uh, multiple properties that he owns that are all underwater, uh, bankruptcy, job loss, you know, so a lot of things that have kind of piled up where, you know, he's got this crater that he's got to dig out of, and the IRS is going to look at that and go, you know what, uh, it's going to be quite some time if you'll ever be able to dig out of that. We most likely won't get everything that we expect that you owe, so we'll settle that for some lesser amount. Um, so short of that offer and compromise, uh, what we can do is get you into an installment, uh, installment plan with the IRS. And, you know, this is one of those things, you, you got the, the tax return prepared, you're going to owe them six, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000, and you just don't have the money to pay that. It's pretty much an automatic thing where you can contact the IRS. We need to get a payment plan set up as we don't have the funds to pay this right now. What can we do? And they'll put you into an installment plan, typically over 72 months, and it's pretty much automatic. You know, so people that contact us with, 
you know, if they've got just the debt that they owe, you know, 10000 or less, and they're pretty well caught up on the returns, we'll just kind of give them some help and guidance to how to do this as opposed to, you know, piling more fees on it for us to come in and do something that they can simply and easily sure. do themselves. Here's what you got to do. Here's the steps, and we'll help them along that way. Um, if you've got a larger amount, um, it will typically be made up of your tax liability, penalties, interest, uh, and other things like that. So there's other things that can be done as far as getting penalties abated or removed um, and then dealing again with the tax liability. Do you really owe the amount that they say you owe? Um, you know, so you can work those, those things within the programs that the IRS has uh, to manage uh, and take care of that. Uh, so you'll help people contest their tax liability too? Is that an option that you'll, you'll pursue? So if, if someone comes to you and says, the IRS says I owe this amount, but, you know, I think they're misapplying sales tax or something yeah. like that. It, and that's the thing. We can go back and look at the tax returns, make sure the tax returns are correct, um, and, you know, come down to what the real tax liability should be. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's different than what's actually being uh, assessed at that point. Uh, and then all of the penalties and interest on that are based on what they've assessed. So if your tax goes down, your interest amount is going to go down because of the uh, the tax liability being different than mm -hmm. uh, what's actually reported. So what's the process for that? Is that basically filing maybe an amended return and, you know, or do you have to go through some sort of appeal process? Well, you start out, if you haven't filed a return, you, you get the return filed. If they've filed a return uh, and the IRS, you know, comes along, denies deductions or, you know, changes things somehow, file an amended return mm -hmm. uh, to get an actual return on, on file with the correct numbers and then begin to deal with uh, the collection division on uh, what that amount is gonna be, what's gonna be removed. They can come down with a decision. Uh, if you're not uh, happy with the decision and still don't feel it's right, they do have a, an appeals process where you can go through and escalate that to different layers uh, within the IRS to, to deal with that initial decision that you still uh, don't agree with. And what's the, oh, go ahead, EJ. No, you good. What, what's the process for an offer and compromise? What does that look like? I assume that you've got to give all sorts of records to the IRS. Oh, yeah. So, you know, they're basically going to do the body cavity search. Uh, you know, they want to know what income you have, what assets you have, and, and what they're really looking for is what the cash flow is. Um, what do you have coming in? What do you have going out? And the, the there's allowable amounts. Uh, so when you go through and do the calculations, you're allowed to have so much for housing and transportation and medical and food and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they're all spelled out in tables. So depending on where you live, uh, you know, how many people you have in the family, if you're married with multiple kids, uh, it's all gated uh, based on those factors. So, you know, they look at, you know, if you've got, you know, 5,000 a month coming in and $4,000 of allowable expenses, which should cover all of your living, they will see that, okay, you've got a thousand dollars of, uh, excess cash flow, and then they'll come up with an amount out of that excess cash flow that you need to pay them to settle your debt. Now, how much would they typically take as far as percentage-wise? Like, if you were if you were helping a client and the client penalized was twenty thousand dollars in debt, and it was a legitimate twenty thousand, how much would they take as far as let's say that client made four thousand dollars? Like. What's the percentage? Like fifty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent? As far as that excess that yeah, they would that take, excess amount. Um, it's typically twenty to twenty-five percent. Okay. Um, you know, the, depending on the circumstance, they may adjust that, but they're really looking for that extra cash flow amount uh, that they can then use to settle the debt. Uh, when you do a payment plan with the IRS, and sorry to be all over the place, no, I had okay. a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of questions that popped up as you were talking about these three different options. When you do a payment plan. Uh, what's the percentage interest you end up paying on that typically? There's a statutory rate. Uh, all the IRS interest rates are published. Um, so the, the, the rate on the payment plans are less than the, uh, the rate they're charging you if you're out of compliance uh, and, and you know, haven't filed, haven't paid. Um, you know, so you're better off getting into the payment plan with them and they'll apply the, the statutory rate. I can't remember what it is. Uh, Do you remember whether it's like money. a crazy high no, rate, no, no, like it, a credit it, card? It's, or not, or a... it's not credit card rates. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anything else you want to add or, or share on the topic? Yeah, you know, we're looking at this from the, uh, the business side. Um, you know, businesses can fall into this category as well. Uh, one of the other areas are the trust fund taxes. Um, this would be payroll taxes or sales taxes. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things that um, we probably talk to your clients about this in terms of setting up your business. You want to either incorporate or set up an LLC uh, to provide yourself the uh, legal liability protection that you get sure. with having uh, you know, that, that entity and that uh, organization set up in front of you. Um, one of the things that a lot of people aren't aware of that uh, the trust fund taxes uh, are not protected by that shield. And this doesn't even just apply to the owner. So a shareholder, uh, a corporation, or a member of an LLC can be held personally liable if there's unpaid payroll tax or if there's unpaid sales tax. So you know, if you look at your paycheck and your employer withholds the money that needs to be paid for the taxes on that side, uh, the, uh, the employer of the business is uh, considered to be holding those funds in trust for the government uh, it goes with their tax dollars that are owed to them. And what happens in a lot of cases, you know, the employer is looking at the amount of tax that they have to pay in from the withholding, and they've got other business expenses and things like that, and they make the wrong decision. Instead of sending the tax dollars in, they buy you know, supplies, equipment, things like that that they need for the business. Um, and from the IRS and the state's perspective, those uh, trust fund dollars are a special kind of ugly. They go after those very, very hard uh, because mm -hmm. you know those are dollars that really, from the time they're withdrawn from the employee paycheck, or in the case of sales tax, when the customer comes in and they buy something from you to collect the sales tax, the, the government considers those are their dollars that you're holding on on their behalf. Um, so again, if the, the business doesn't remit those dollars for sales tax or for payroll tax the owners of the LLC or the corporation can be held liable for those personally. Cool. Uh, so e it, even a silent partner who's not managing the business has no even, responsibility? What they look for at that point is who the responsible person is. Okay. Uh, and responsible person uh, can be defined in a number of ways, but what they're really looking for is one is are they actively involved in the business? Are they making decisions about how the money is spent in the business? So, you know, they've got, uh, you know, they're a signer on the bank account. They're deciding, you know, do I pay the rent or do I pay the tax? Um, but you can, and I've, I've got a case in front of me like this right now, uh, a, a, a silent investor wasn't actively involved in the business, um, but was a member of uh, the entity and the business went belly up. So now the state's looking for their sales tax money, and they do what they do. They went and looked at the records. Who were the owners? Who can we get in contact with? Okay, we found owner B, who was a passive investor in the business. You owe us X amount of dollars for the sales tax that wasn't paid. And they're standing there going, I wasn't involved in the business day to day. I just invested. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, even to the point where if it's a, a bookkeeper or an accountant in the business that isn't an owner, but they're responsible for directing how the funds are spent and managed in the business. Uh, there's even been cases where an outside accountant uh, who had a bookkeeping responsibility for the business was held as being defined as the responsible person. Um, you know, so the lines aren't always very clear. They want their money. They're going to figure out how to go after it. So, um, you know, what I need to do in the case that I just described, I have to uh, put together to, uh, put together the case that demonstrate that the person that they're going after for these dollars isn't the responsible person, and here are the reasons and the factors why. Okay. Still a steep hill to find, but wow. a, a case can be made for that. All right, Tony, anything else you want to talk about on this subject? Oh. I feel like I've gotten a lot of information out of <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we, uh, we covered it pretty well. Uh, if someone we, needs your help, how can they reach you? Uh, they can give me a call. Uh, the main number for the office is 847-915-6007. Uh, they can get us on the internet at polariscpa.com. Uh, and they can always uh, contact you and uh, get to me through you as well. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time <laughs> today. Good I appreciate job. you having me today. Good job. All right. Thank you.